you could feel that there was a change in the way that, in the tide, not just with H Street, but with every company. I just, I just think that video, that the H Street video was so raw. I think that that ethos went out into the world and kids everywhere, I think, saw that and said, yeah, we, we can do this. I was skateboarding with Mike Ternowski and we were filming and he wanted, he wanted more than I could give at that time. And it was just a weird time in my life. And I just kind of snapped right, right there, skating this curb. It's like, stop skating it. And just like, I don't know, dude, I think I need to just get away for some. I need to just do something else. I'm, I'm kind of falling apart here. I moved to Chicago to be a paramedic. I always figured I would want to play in a band sometime. Absolutely. I just didn't know. I didn't know it was going to be an accordion. I didn't know it was going to be a band from LA, even though I'm from San Diego. I didn't know all the details. Even when I lived in Chicago, we'd have three or four guys that would get together and <clears throat> play play music. Even before I moved to Chicago, I was in a uh, I was in a ska band called the Spy Kids from San Diego. And actually, the keyboard player was Scott Russo, who was uh, Unwritten Law. Uh, and all the other guys, a lot of the horns and stuff, turned into Bucko Nine and I was a, a guitar player in that band. Uh, the accordion is, is a weird thing. I, even when I was touring, I would stop at, uh, you know, at pawn shops and stuff and always kind of be attracted to the accordions in the, in the place. And I'd try to play them, but they're a difficult thing to do, so I, I, was, I liked them, I liked the tone of them, but I, did, I just couldn't figure them out. And uh, it wasn't until after I lived in Chicago and did all these things that I, I bought an accordion. I actually first bought a banjo for about two weeks. Uh, I never played the banjo before and I liked it, but it wasn't, it wasn't enough. And then I went and bought an accordion and that, and that was it. I was hooked. It's not like you're gonna like, get a bunch of chicks and people are all gonna be stoked. This doesn't happen. You'd play a guitar or play the drums or something cool and not, not that instrument. But in my mind, like, I, the way that I think about that instrument, I just, uh, you know, if, if you mix it with like an Irish bar or and or, you know, music from all around the world, it actually, to me, has like a really cool working class kind of feeling to it. It's, it really, if you go around the world, that's the one instrument that if you played people's street music, the music they cry to when someone in their family dies or they play at a wedding, it's played with an accordion. Just, I fell in love with the tone that this instrument makes. I called all around, I found an Italian instructor. And by that time, I'm 23 or 24 years old, and I'm like, I know it sounds crazy, but I'm dead serious. I would like to get lessons like three times a week, and I wanted to do this. Always constantly bringing my accordion out to bars and playing. I, I took it to a bar in San Marcos uh, called the Camelot, or it used to be called the Camelot. I don't know what it's called now. Uh, but there was like an English kind of quasi-Irish band that was playing, and after they were done playing, I'm like, well, hey man, uh, this is before I was in Fong Mall, I'm like, hey, uh, you guys maybe want an accordion player in the outfit, you know? I was trying to get in their band. And he's like, well, what do you see what you got, kid? So he, I went outside and I started playing for him. And as I was doing it, out of nowhere, all of a sudden there was a guy rolls up to me. I could see him walking towards me and he's in his underpants. He's like wearing tidy whities just rolling up. Random, it's crazy. Uh, and he rolls right up and he taps, he taps me in the accordion, you know? He's all, shut the fuck up. And I'm, I'm playing and I'm, I, I just had enough drinks in me or I wasn't going to accept that shit. And I just kept on playing, <laughs> kept on playing and he's tapping me and he's giving me all this shit and he just, he just keeps on, you know, telling me to shut up and I won't. One of my friends sees something that I can't see and then he tell, I see it happen. He whispers to these guys and my, all my boys scatter, dude. They're fucking gone. So I, I kept on playing a little bit but now I was hesitating and then he's all, you're going to shut up? And I'm like, no man, I ain't. And then he just goes, if, and he just like, you know, he gets exasperated now. He's like, fuck it. And he gives me one more tap and then he, and he bails. He goes the other direction. And when I see him walking away, then I realize that he's been poking me with a fucking gun. I didn't even know he had a gun because I have an accordion that goes out like this. So he's going like this, telling me to shut the fuck up. And I'm telling him to go fuck himself with a gun in me. So I almost lost my life right from the very beginning, dude, for the, for the squeeze box. My girlfriend, soon to be my wife, bought me tickets to see a band called These Darn Accordion Players, which is a, like 11 piece all accordion band from San Francisco. Uh, and I went to LA to see this band, <laughs> which was great. And then afterwards I went to an Irish bar called Molly Malone's <clears throat> and I was sitting there with my friend of mine and we were having a drink and I went to the restroom and while I was in there, he had seen Dave King, the singer of this band. Their band that he was in at the time had just broken up. 
and they, were, they played Irish music, Irish drinking music kind of stuff, and he goes, hey man, uh, you don't know me, but my friend, who's in the toilet, plays accordion. So when I come out of the restroom, and I sit down and grab my beer, and then I see this guy going to the, looking, you know, starting from one end of the bar to the other, and kind of like tapping people on the shoulder and getting like a good look at their noggin, and then whatever, and like, just kind of like tr looking for what an accordion player looks like. He tapped me on the shoulder, and, and he's all, you're not, you're not the kid, are you? And I'm like, uh, the kid for what? Because I didn't know the context of what we're talking here. I thought he was actually maybe picking a fight with me. I didn't know what was going to happen. Uh, and he's all, you, you play the accordion? And I'm all, I, I do. He gave me a tape for the band, uh, like, a, like a live recording of it. And he's all, learn this, and uh, we'll have a rehearsal in two weeks. So I'm all, all right. And I just took it home. And then I went up to that practice, and then I practiced with all these people that were really good musicians, much better than myself. Uh, Dave, at the end of it, I'm also, what's up, dude? And I was driving another two hours to go home, and like three o'clock in the morning, and he's like, oh, you, you're in the band, dude. You're in the band. I only been practicing accordion for maybe a year and two months. I'm standing around all these people that are super talented, and Dave's a, a genius songwriter and singer. I mean, it was humbling to, to, to be in that room. So when I was done with that first audition, I was like, I need, I need to practice. So I just, I brought that accordion with me everywhere I went. Our first couple gigs at Molly Malone's for, you know, not that many people, you know, we would have a, we'd, we'd talk with each other and Dave was like, this is serious. I mean, there's all kinds of bands, there's all kinds of things we can do, but we're going to take this serious. We're going to be a fucking, we're going to be a fucking band. We're, we're not going to just play in L.A. only. We're going to fucking tour the world. We'd already been a band for three years and we started moving out of Los Angeles and going to different places. We would go up the coast. I mean, our first gig in San Jose, went fucking off. Mostly skaters and just that whole crew, like from our note one, like a bottle went flying past my head, crashed up on the guitar player, it was fucking blood, beer, everything. It just went crazy and it, it was put such a smile on my face. I was like, this is, this is so good to be doing this. And uh, that was the first crowd after, out of Los Angeles that like, we, we were like, we could actually do this for real. Not just in Los Angeles be an LA band, but we can, we can, we can do this. We'd go on six on, one off. So every Monday we'd play in Boston. Every Tuesday we'd play in New York somewhere, right? And that's what it happened for like five weeks. Our first time that we ever played all these places, you know, no one had ever heard of us. By like the third time we, that, that residency was happening, we were selling it out. In the beginning, when, when Foggy Molly was first being created, uh, I, I didn't let those guys know that I was a skateboarder, or at least, a, you know, I told them I was a professional skateboarder, but I didn't go into great detail. I kind of wanted to have, uh, the, you know, the music kind of stand up on its own. And I remember our drummer at one point coming up to me, and, he, and he's like all, uh, you know, I told my guy, my friend from Ohio, and he's heard of you. How does, my, how does this guy in Ohio know who you are? I've skateboarded in Ohio 30 times. I've done demos there my whole life. Uh, he, he, that tripped him out, he didn't really get it. And I, that, that kind of thing happened with almost everybody in the band, uh, where they were just like, fuck, dude. Uh, yeah, my, my, you know, my brother knows who you are. I was a picture of somebody, you're on his wall or something. That, that sort of thing kind of happened, and that's how it went down. I left Lagamale uh, in 2007. At the time, um, I was suffering from uh, depression. Uh, so. Uh, these decisions, it's just, you know, when my, when my son was born, I was in Flogamali. And I've spent, you know, I can't tell you how many, you know, nights uh, on the road, on the road for eight or nine months out of a year and not seeing your brand new kid. It's difficult. And then you play this game of what's more important. Uh, you know, at some, you know, I, I make money for my family and I'm, I'm supporting them, but I'm not around them. So you just kind of go through this game <clears throat> and it just gets, you know, it just gets hard sometimes, and <clears throat> you know, over the years, I mean, 10 years of, you know, 11 years of that, it, it just started to get to me. I've just felt like, fuck, I've just missed so much, and it, it just kind of all, it all came together, and when I left the band, I got to a point where I asked my own kid, uh, you know, what he thought, and he was like, I all I've ever known is you doing this. Like, so, he has no A and B. He thinks I'm a great father, because he's used to me being home for this amount of time, and that's what he, that's what, he's cool with it. It wasn't even him, it was me. He was like, I, I loved it when you were in Flagamoli, you know? You seem way more bummed now that you're not in it. I mean, that's just the truth. And so it took 11 year old to tell a, a fucking 30, you know, eight year old how to, how to do his thing right. And there's no other way to say that and not be emotional. It was, it was a hard time right there. And, um, but I got back in the band and I will tell you it was the best thing I have ever done. I, I will tell you I will never, 
you know, depression or not, I'm not gonna let this ever slip through my hands again. I meet people all the time that don't even skateboard, but that love our music and have, you know, played it at their son's funerals. And, and I mean, it, it's meant a lot of things to a lot of people. I could, without crying would be hard, but I can tell you stories from people that have been related to our music. And it's like, fuck, like, I don't even know what I was, you know, whinging about, uh, crying about, about, you know, my woe is me and my life's not good. Like, you know, we played in uh, <clears throat> Croatia and somebody's been blown up in the Bosnia and Croatian wars. And a raggedy ass Flagamali shirt on, you know, just beat the shit. All he wants from me is that he wants a Guinness and a cigarette. And he's like, I was gonna kill myself last week. Had the gun in my mouth and I saw you guys were playing, so I, I hold it off, I wanna see you guys. I mean, it's like, whew, and he means it. I'm fucking blessed to be in this position. And when you meet people that have their lives so fucked and your music means a lot, it, it's, it's, it, it changes things. It makes you just check yourself. Like every time I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I have to fucking wake up or whatever. It's like, shut the fuck up. Because there are people that for real just have it so fucking terrible are not even around. I believe I'm really lucky. My life's been skateboarding and playing music. And if I can continue to do these two things, uh, you know, and somehow put a shirt on my, my son's back while I'm doing it, I've, I'm a lucky man. I wouldn't be playing accordion in this crazy band if it wasn't for skateboarding. I know that to be the truth. I mean, it's just, it's skateboarding's given me everything. This rail right here, right now, is one deck. It made sense to me at the time. I just think I was just confused. And I, I, all I had ever done to that moment was ride a skateboard. 